Paul is writing to Timothy. Something got his attention. Either somebody said something to him about Timothy or a thought penetrated his mind. You know, sometimes when you're away from somebody that you know, your thoughts will go to them. Though, though you're not close, though you haven't seen them, maybe an inflection on somebody's voice, uh, perhaps something that you've seen or read or something reminds you of that person. Paul was reminded of Timothy and he said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, he says, I have re been reminded of your sincere faith. Can I just say to you this morning, if you want to compliment me, if you want to find a way to compliment your pastor, all you have to do is say he has a sincere faith. I don't want you to say it if you don't think it's true, but that would be an honor to me for somebody to say, I know that your faith is sincere. But he goes on to say, as Paul, not the father of Timothy, a spiritual father of Timothy, is looking back and reminding him, you have sincere faith. But then he said, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois. How many grandmothers do we have? Let me see your hands. Grandmas, or grandma, or grandmama, or nana, or whatever your name is. Can I tell you today, you have an influence on your grandchildren. If you have walked with God all of your life, you have had an influence on your grandchildren's mother, and you continue to have an influence on your grandchildren. My grandson, I think he's in the service here. There he is up there in the balcony. Uh, Caleb, the other day, was in another room, and, and I heard him call out, Nana! Nana! And I said, Caleb, what do you need? I need my Nana! I said, well, what is it, Caleb? I can help you. No, I just need my Nana. How many of you know sometimes you just need your Nana? I could have done for him what she could have done. He didn't want his papa to do it. He wanted his nana to do it. Grandmas, you have an influence. Nanas, you have an influence into your grandchildren's life. Never underestimate the influence that you have. Then he, Paul goes on to say, not only in your grandmother, first in your grandmother Lois, but then he said, and in your mother Eunice. What a heritage this young man had. That first his grandmother had a sincere faith. Then his mother had an encounter with God that led to sincere faith. And now Paul says, and I am persuaded now lives in you. First in his grandmother, then in his mother. And it wasn't passed on as a, as a piece, of, piece of clothing or a treasure would be passed on from one generation to another. For every generation has to come to a relationship or come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. God is a personal God. Timothy wasn't a man of sincere faith because Lois was or because Eunice was. He saw it in their lives. He witnessed it firsthand in their lives and which led him to know that if God can work in their lives, God can work in my life. Paul said, I see your sincere faith. This morning, being Mother's Day, I... I want to share with you something I've never done before. As I said before, my mother is with Jesus. Three days before my birthday, she graduated from this life. I remember when, when I received the telephone call, I was uh, sitting in my recliner. Actually, I was reclined in my recliner. recliner. And back in February, uh, there was little I could do but sit in my recliner. Can I tell you? I'm wearing shoes today. Hallelujah. <laughs> And not only am I wearing shoes, I'm wearing socks. Now, to those of you that guess, that doesn't mean a thing to you. But there, this is the first time, actually the second day that I have been able to wear a pair of dress shoes in five months. Five long months. I went to the, my plastic surgeon, and he looked at me and he said, Pastor, there's nothing more I can do for you. And I thought to myself, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'm not real sure. He says, you're through, you're done. So I'm done. And so I was able to take the wrappings off and all of, the, all of that. And he pres not prescri prescribed uh, special uh, socks. Somebody said they're hose. I said, no, they're not. They're socks. <laughs> Men don't wear hose. <laughs> it keeps the swelling down. You're not interested, I can see. <laughs> but I can tell you what, when you can be 
when you can be excited about wearing socks and shoes, that's a pretty big deal in my mind. I was laying in the, or sitting in the recliner and Susan called me and said, Mother has gone to heaven. And, and I, I sat there, after I talked to her and hung the phone up, I sat there and I, it was like, it, it was almost as though I had hit a button, a rewind button on a video tape or a DVD that went all the way back to the first memories I had of my mother. And we just played them forward, just one right after another, re- remembering mother and all of the things that she had done. And, and about the time I was finished, I remembered some other things that we had had together, shared together. So this morning, I want to share with you five things that my mother taught me. I, I speak this into the lives of those of you that are young mothers so that perhaps in some way I can impart to you or share with you or encourage you in some way that, that there is something that you can do to prepare your children for their future. To mothers who, whose children are a little bit older, maybe in something you hear here, here this morning, it will encourage you not to give up on your children, but to believe that, that God is not a God of a season. God is a God of all time. And so I, I just want to share five things that I learned from my mother, five things my mother taught me. Now, she taught me many more things than five, but these are the five that I narrowed down that I thought would be an encouragement to you mothers this morning. My mother taught me to order my steps righteously. My mother had a holiness background, uh, Methodist holiness. Now, this was way back in the day when she was born. My grandfather was a Methodist deacon, small church in Bone Steel, South Dakota, where mother was born and raised, where uh, her family had lived, Norwegian family had lived for years, where I was, I was not born in Bone Steel, but I was born in South Dakota. And she was born into a holiness family. Now, by that, I mean that the scripture that says, be ye holy as I am holy, this family took that seriously. It, it wasn't just a scripture. It wasn't just something that, that they tried to do. They, they gave effort and energy to living a holy life. Now, I will admit to you that a lot of the holiness had to do on the outside, but, but, but the Fisher family, they were holiness on the inside as well. I remember my mother, uh, my grandmother and our family, they had visited us in California and in the Bay Area and we had gone up to the mountains to spend some time and um, I, I think I was probably about seven or eight years old and we had stopped on the road, they had uh, fruit stands and uh, they would have cold, fresh fruits that had been grown in the valley and they had taken and, and they had iced cold drinks. Typically, they would have uh, uh, plastic containers of fresh squeezed apple juice. And usually that's what we got. But this day, my dad told me, he said, you can get anything you want. Well, now, I, you didn't hear that very often in my family. We didn't have the funds to be able to get anything you want. So, so I was looking around, and they had a, they had a whole uh, bucket, literally bucket full of, of bottled soft drinks. And so I was looking, and, and you know, as an eight, nine, ten-year-old little boy, I, man, I, was, I, wanted to, I wanted the biggest one they had. Almost didn't care what it tasted like. I just wanted a lot of it. And so I reached down, and I got a bottle of Frosty's Root Beer. And I had that bottle, and oh, man, I was so proud of that bottle. Couldn't wait to pop the top. Remember those days where you had to pop the top? Couldn't wait to pop the top. And I looked over at my grandmother, and she was, Grandma Fisher, and she was looking, and I, I said, Grandma, would you like a root beer? And she looked at me, and she said, I will not. Well, Grandma never talked like that. <laughs> and I said, what's wrong? You don't like root beer? She said, I will never drink anything that has beer in its name. <laughs> I looked at her as though she was talking a foreign language. Didn't understand what she meant by that, but, but I, I say that to give you the context of, of how my mother was raised. Uh, if it had the appearance, appearance of evil, and, and for Grandma Fisher, beer was just about as evil as you could get. She wouldn't have any part of it, but she let me drink my root beer. I, boy, I held my root beer. She wouldn't take my root beer from me, and we went on. That, that's the... That's the environment that my mother mother grew up on. She, she demonstrated to me a relationship with God. I never questioned my mother's relationship with Jesus Christ. Never had an opportunity to question. She never gave me reason 
to doubt. When I was born, mother, mother and dad were both, ra- both in the church. They were saved. Dad had backslidden and in the army and before that was just really living a, a wild life that he doesn't really like to talk about. And um, it was only later in years that he began to let me little glimpses of what he went through. And boy, that's a story in itself. But she mirrored for me what it was to live a life of faith in God. I think I could say of my mother, she had sincere faith. It was a sincere faith that not only affected her the way she looked on the outside, and anybody, any of you who knew my mother, my mother was a lady. She was a lady. She dressed to the T all the time. I, people used to, and dad too, just always, just always right. Mother prim and proper. Her house was always immaculate. Every room in the house was perfect except one room. And that was my room. <laughs> she, would, uh, she would tell me, Steve, go clean your room. And I'd go and I'd kind of take the clothes and fluff them up a little bit and I'm done. And she would go in there and say, no, 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 clean your room. And it got to a point where she would just close the door. If we had guests that would come into the house, every door would be open because she's proud of every room except one door. Is, and you know everybody wanted to go into that door. She would not let them go into my room. <laughs> my room. She mirrored for me what it was to be a person of sincere and great faith. She, she consistently lived righteously. Those of you that knew mother, how she was here is exactly how she was at home. She didn't play games. She didn't put on masks. She didn't try to impress you. She was what she was. People would ask me, do your mom and dad, do they dress up when they mow the yard? Does your dad wear a suit and tie when he mows the yard? Does your mother wear a dress when she works out in the yard? Well, no, of course not, but almost. Mother was always, always immaculately dressed. She was... She was the epitome, I think, of grace. But, but that's the way she was. And when she was in church, when you talked to her, when you conversed with her, when you interacted with her, the way she was there is exactly the way she was at home. She didn't put on her church face and then leave to become who she really was. That's exactly who she was. So all of my life, I had before me a mirror image of what it was to be a Christian, what it was to be a believer, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. My mother also taught me to honor God's word. Honor God's word. Now, it's not often that you have an opportunity talking about your mother to be able to have her address you. Now, my mother's in heaven, so she's not long distance addressed, but she has something that she shared a number of years ago about the word of God that I've asked our media department to present to you this morning. Now, before we look at this clip, I want you to notice when she opens her Bible, I want you to notice the number of pages that are written on her words, her thoughts, her revelation. And I want you to, if you would, as you watch this, just notice what her Bible looks like. Let's watch. Talking about reading the Bible, I love the Bible. We've been reading it for years and years and years seems like it never gets old, it never gets tiresome, and the most important thing I think about it, it shows us the way to live, it shows us the, the, uh, the, the method in order to live a good life, and it's also a guide to heaven, so you can't, can't lose on that, can you? This, this, book has been an, this book has been an inspiration to me for years and years and years, and I've got in it uh, a number of things that have meant so much to me in the past still does. And as I recall, the notes that I have in here, different places I've been, it's been around the world actually, and it's been with me for years, and I really treasure it. But most of all, I think, uh, when, when, when I think of living, when I think of teaching me how to live, I'm kind of selfish. I want to live the best kind of life. I want to make the most of my life. I want to have the best of my life lived for Jesus so that at the end, when I go to heaven, I'm going there. When I go to heaven, he will say, well done. And I'm looking forward to those days, looking forward to that time when I go to heaven. But in the meantime, I'm having a wonderful journey. And it's been a great, it's been a great journey with you. Mother and dad read the Bible through many, many, many times in their lives. You noticed in her Bible 
there were probably as many of her words written on those pages as there was printed on those pages. As they would take the seasons of reflection Bible study reading guide that we have here in the church that we use as our devotion here at Brazewood, they would open the book and they would lay it. They had two recliners, mother and dad's recliner, and they would open the book and find out where they were, the reading was, assigned reading was, and then they would take out their Bibles. And they would, as they were reading, they would write, each of them would write whatever God put on their heart. As mother and dad would be sitting in the front here and somebody would be preaching, they would write notes, they would take notes. Dad could always tell you if somebody preached the same sermon twice because he had in his Bible the date and who preached the sermon kept me on my toes. Mother would write, and, and as the, Susan and Lori and Donna were cleaning out their apartment when they moved to their residence now, um, before Mother passed, um, they took the Bible, Mother's Bible, Dad's Bible, and, and I don't think anybody has that Bible yet because all of us want that Bible. And I suspect what's going to happen is we're going to have an assignment, a sign time where Susan gets it for a little while and then Lori gets it for a little while and then I get it for a little while. And I think when I get it, I'm going to, I'm going to have somebody Xerox it for me. I, 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 want to, I want to read what God revealed in their heart. When they read the word of God, they expected God to speak something into their life. They expected it. It, it was God's word. They, they, they taught us to respect God's word. When I was growing up, we would, every night, Monday through Friday, we would have Bible reading. Mother would sit us on the couch. Susan and Lori would be on one side, I'd be on the other side. And first of all, she'd say, Steve, go get, the, go get the Bible guide, the reading guide. And we had these the volumes of books that, that were children's stories from Genesis to Revelations. And I would go out and I would pick wherever we had left off and I had brought it. And, and I remember Susan and Lori on one side, I was on the other side. We'd lean over on Mother's shoulder to be able to see the pictures, the illustrations of the, of the, uh, of the pictures. The story of, of David and Goliath scared Lori. She was scared of the giant. So anytime mother read that story, she had to put her hand over the giant or Lori would get scared. We'd read. We, we didn't read Bible stories on Saturday nights because on Saturday nights we studied for our Sunday school lesson. How many of you remember the day of the quarterly? Uh, Saturday night. We got ready for church. Saturday night, we prepared. I had a job of polishing shoes, and that's what I did on Saturday night. And then we get our Bible studies out, and we would study the Bible for the next day. Mother and dad were so committed to the word of God that they taught me, mother taught me, you never put anything on top of the Bible. Never. Even to this day, 55 years later, Sometimes in my office, I'll have my Bible and it'll be sitting on my desk and I'll have something. I'll be looking at a book or reading a book or something and I'll take it and I'll set it over on there. And the minute I do it, I stop, take it out and put the Bible on top. Always. That's the way we were taught. We were taught to respect the word. It's a book. It's just a book, but it represents God's word. It was, it was more than just words to her. It was, it was God's word. It was... It was God speaking, God writing a letter. My mother was a letter writer. We don't, that's not an art anymore, is it? It's emails now or text messages or Twitter or whatever that thing's called. But, but she had the art of writing letters and mother's handwriting was beautiful. I mean, it was artistic. I wish I had that gift. She would write letters to Grandma Fisher. Every week they would correspond. And sometimes back in the day, it'd, it'd take almost a week for a letter to get to you. She'd correspond back and forth writing letters. To her, the Bible was God's letter to her. And so she would read it with an expectation that, that God was imparting something to her. Not just information, but God was imparting his heart to her personally. She always made the word of God personal and read it as though God were speaking only to her. But as she read the word of God, as she honored the word of God, it was also an issue of, of obedience. She took to heart, you read to obey. I, I can hear her say it. I've heard her say it one time. I've heard her say it a thousand times. Don't be hearers of the word only, but doers of the word. She didn't read just to read or read just for knowledge. She read for two reasons. One, for God to impart into her heart and spirit, but two, that she might impart into somebody else's life. That if somebody came to her for counsel, it wasn't just 
words that she spoke. It was God's word that she spoke. When she taught her Sunday school class, and she taught that class for years and years, building, building healthy families. For years and years and years with Brother Ray Fredericks, uh, she prepared, she poured over that material, knowing that God had something to speak to her and through her. She read to obey, and she read to serve. My mother taught me to order my steps righteously. She taught me to honor God's word. And my mother taught me to love the church. My sister said, Sister Susan said, uh, during mother's graduation service, something that we joked about but never said publicly, and that is that there were four, actually four children in the Banning family, Steve, Susan, Lori, and the church. The church was the fourth Banning child, and we often thought that you were the favorite too, can I tell you that? The favorite child. Mother loved the church. Can I tell you today that, that the Banning children were always in church. If the doors were open, we were in church. Sunday, Wednesday, and, and during revivals. And this was back in the day when I was growing up where you could have a week-long revival. And if it was a good one, it might go into another week, to my disappointment. I had television programs I needed to watch. And we were there every service. We were the first ones there, usually, and we were usually the last ones to leave. Because that was back in the day when the pastor's family was the janitorial service of the church. We opened the church, we closed the church. Taught us to love the church in prayer meetings and revivals. There were times where there was no child care. There was no, I, I wish, dream that I could have been in ministries like this. We didn't have this. We had a lot of times where we were just sitting next to mother in the service. And I can, can't tell you the number of times that she thumped me on my ear. In fact, there were a couple of times I think I went, ouch, because I was, I was fidgeting or messing around, and she just gave me a little thump right on the top of the ear. Maybe that's why my ear is so tender today. I don't know. <laughs> thumped me, thump me on my ear. And I, I can remember, too, that when I got old enough to sit off by myself, I was under scrutiny because Dad was always on the platform. And I never got away with nothing. I remember one time he said, Stephen Earl, that was the kiss of death. Not only the middle name, but your whole first name, Stephen Earl. Go sit by your mother. I had to get up from over on this side of the church and walk all the way across and sit by my mother. Most humiliating thing I ever had. <laughs> always attended church. She never sent us to church. She always took us to church. And, and can I tell you, Mother, and you, I want you to hear what I'm about to say because I've heard, I heard somebody tell me, a pastor tell me the other day that when he was growing up, he loved the church as a teenager. It's a conflict between his growing up and my growing up. I hated the church. He loved the church. He'd go up all, he told me, he said, when, when he would do wrong, his parents would punish him by not letting him go to Wednesday night service. And when I heard that, my heart was broken. In fact, you should never punish your children by not taking them to church. If you're going to punish them, punish them by taking them to church. No, that didn't come out right. Make them. You, if, they're, if they're doing wrong, they need to be in church. That's what I wanted to say. They need to be in. <laughs> they need to be. In, it's no punishment to go to church. Please don't misunderstand me. She never sent us to church. She took us to church. In the church, I was taught to respect people. Growing up in San Francisco, right outside of San Francisco, it was a multicultural community. Our schools were thoroughly integrated, thoroughly encultured, and uh, we were taught to respect people. I remember mother saying, when you're talking to somebody, you look into their eyes. You look at them in the eye. Never glance away. It's disrespectful. Never, never be distracted. Always look at them in the eye. She said, the eyes will communicate what nothing else will communicate. She, she taught us to, to respect people. So much so respect that, that we didn't call our elders by their first name. I hear children calling um, other people's mother and dad by their first name. Bill, Bob. Oh, we never did that. I, in fact, I remember mother and dad both sticklers. It was brother and sister so-and-so. Brother and sister Smith. Brother and si It was always brother and sister. I remember going upstairs one time. California, we're walking upstairs, three buddies, or two buddies and myself walking up the stairs, we're walking up the stairs, and one of the fathers come down, the first young man, his father was coming down the stairs, and this young man said to his father, hi, Howard, 
Next young man said, hi, Howard. Well, I wasn't going to be outdone. I said, hi, Howard. And I'm telling you, within split second after those words came out of my mouth, I heard Stephen Earl. <laughs> what did I do? So I marched up the stairs and I stood in front of my dad. Yes. He said, what did you just do? Nothing. See, I had that down real good. No, I wasn't going to admit to anything. Nothing. He said, what did you call that man? Oh, now I know what he got me about. I called him Howard. He said, you go find Brother Danielson. And he said it that way. You go find Brother Danielson and you apologize to him. So here's a little 10-year-old boy. I'm walking down the steps. I got to find Brother Danielson. I don't know where he is. I'm walking through the church opening doors and <laughs> seeing if he's there. He was in an adult Sunday school class. Here's a 10-year-old boy walking into an adult Sunday school class. I walked up to this man and I said, I'm sorry. He said, what did you do? I called you Howard. <laughs> he said, he said, oh, that's okay. I said, no, it's not okay. <laughs> when, when Don and I got married, I called her parents, brother and sister Montgomery. My dad, to the day my grandpa and grandma Fisher passed, he called them brother and sister Fisher. We were taught to respect people. We would have people come by our house. And, and apparently where we lived in California and, and in Cleveland, a lot of, we didn't call them homeless people back then, we called them hobos. Hobos would come by the house, knock on the door. Mother would open the door. Do you have anything you can spare, any food you can spare? Mother would go to the pantry or the cupboards and she would just get her hands full with food. And, and if they were in cans, she'd give them her can opener. And, and, just, and then she'd go into dad's closet and get some of his clothes and give them, to, give, them to the, give them to the man. And I can tell you, somebody must have marked our house because we had a lot of people come by our house. <laughs> Mother was always there, gate. Never, never, never said no. Never, never. Never criticized somebody. Never closed the door and said, can you believe that? Look at that man. What's wrong with it? Never, 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 never. In fact, if there was anything said after the door was closed, it was a prayer for that man's blessing. She taught us to respect people, elders, cultures, dignity. You know, probably heard my mother thought that she was going to be a missionary or a missionary's wife. And, uh, and, and in reality, she was, though she didn't, well, they did have opportunity to travel all over the world, but, but just in this church at Brazewood, she had an opportunity to to be a part of many, many cultures and many, many nationalities. She taught us to love the church. My mother taught me to love my family. I never questioned that my mother loved me. Not one time. I didn't always agree with her. I didn't always respect her to her face. Or I always respected her to her face, or usually, but I never questioned that she loved me. Even when she disciplined me, she loved me. She'd tell me, our family is a hugging family. We hug all the time. In fact, if we see each other, we hug. When we leave each other, we hug. And we just might all just get up and have a hug anyway. And, and it got not until the end of my mother's life that I would not only hug her, but give her a kiss on the cheek. I'd never done that before. First time I did it, she was in a hospital bed. And, and then from that point on, every time I'd hug her, I'd give her a kiss on the cheek. Now I give my dad a kiss on the forehead. When, when, when I see my son James, 30 years old, every time I see him, I'll grab him and I'll give him a kiss right here on the cheek, I mean on the neck. I don't care whether he likes it or not. Doesn't matter to me. And we were a family that told each other we loved each other all the time. Not, not just when we greeted, not just when we left. We could be sitting down at the dinner table and mother would look over at him and say, Steve, I love you. Love you too, mother. Love you, Lori. Love you too, mother. Love you, Susan. Love you too, Mother. It could be any time. She could be cooking, cooking a meal, and she'd call us in as kids. She'd call us in and say, Stephen, come into the kitchen. What do you want? Just come into the kitchen. I'd come in the kitchen. She'd say, Steve, I love you. Is that what you wanted? <laughs> yeah, I just want to tell you I love you. I'd, and I'd get so put off with that, but oh, if I could go back. If I could go back. She taught me to love my family. My mother loved my dad. Never a question. <laughs> divorce was never in their vocabulary. Now, some of you have heard divorce is not in the vocabulary, murder is, but not in my family. 
Not in my family. Mother loved dad. I never heard, growing up as a child, I never heard my mother criticize my dad. I never heard my mother make fun of my dad. Can I go back and correct the word? I said I never heard her criticize him. The only criticism she ever gave when I was a child was about his driving. She would say, Earl, keep your eyes on the road. Just like that. Earl, keep your eyes on the road. Because dad, when he's driving, he's driving like this. Dad didn't want to miss anything. <laughs> Earl, keep your eyes on the road. If I heard that once, I heard it from the back seat. I heard it a thousand times. Mother sitting next to dad. Earl, keep your eyes on the road. She never criticized him. She loved him. My mother taught me how to love my wife. Just by watching her. She taught me how to respect my spouse by watching her. She taught me. She disciplined me. My mother disciplined me. What I'm about to tell you, moms, especially mother young, mother, younger mothers, <laughs> I want you to listen to these words. These are wise words. My mother was not my friend. She was my mother. I want you to remember that. I want you to remember that. My mother was never my friend. She was always my mother. And those lines were never blurred. She was my mother. She didn't want to be my friend. She wanted to be my mother. And to, to, to my mother, being a mother was the highest calling of ever, of life, to be a mother. She, she would tell me later in years, she would tell me, oh, if I could just go back and redo it again. And I thought, you know, I, at the time I didn't think so, but later on I thought, well, she's a perfect mother. When I was growing up, I thought she had all kind of flaws. But, but in retrospect, I thought she was just, she was a wonderful mother, just almost perfect. She said, if I had to go back, I would do things differently. And I asked her one time, what would you do differently? She said, there were th some things that, that I thought were so important, and they really weren't important at all. And there were some things that I didn't think were important, and now I know how important they were if I could just go back. And there's not a parent in this room that wouldn't give whatever they have just to be able to do that one more time, to go back and just make some changes. She was, she was my mother. She disciplined us. Oh, she disciplined us. But she always affirmed us. Steve, you can do it. You can make it. You can accomplish whatever it is that you put your heart and mind to accomplish. There was one time I remember that um, my mother and I, when I was a teenager, we, we would just go at it like this. It wasn't her fault. It's mine. To, to those of you that are, that are young and live under your mother's care, I just tell you, there are going to be things you're going to regret if you don't change them right now. If I could go back and just stop some of the arguments that I had with my mother that really did not mean a thing. Just I was bullheaded. I was stubborn. I was a jerk. We would go at it sometimes. We were in the kitchen one time, and boy, we were going at it. And I was giving her lip. I was sassing her. I was disrespecting her like you would not believe. And this went on for some minutes. And all of a sudden, right in the middle of something I was saying, she reached across and she went, whop! Right there. I never thought I'd get that kind of response. <laughs> First of all of the services, I've gotten that kind of response. But she did. She, and, and it wasn't just a little tap. She, whoa. And my mother was a little lady. But I'm going to tell you, she was strong. And both of us kind of took a step back and just looked at me. My eyes were this big. Her eyes were this big. And I was mad. I was ticked off. I was mad. And I spun around and I marched out there just every foot hitting the ground as loud as I could go and got into my room and slammed the door and laid down on the bed. And this, this is a day when the stereos were this big, uh, the stereo headphones were this big, covered your whole head. I put on my headphones and Turn the music up, just almost bleeding out of my eyes. I was mad. And I was thinking, oh, Lord, I can't wait to get out of this house. Can't wait to get out of here. And all of a sudden, I, was, I, I noticed my door was moving. And, I, and my mother kind of took the headphones off, and she was knocking on the door. And she opened the door and stuck her head in. And this is my thought. God forgive me, this is my thought. We're going to go at it again. But she's not going to hit me again. No, she had. I guarantee you, I'd have stand there and I'd have taken it. 
She walked in and tears coming down her face, down her eyes, tears. She said, Steve, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And, and if you thought my eyes were big before, they're real big now. Coming out of their socket big. And, and, and I didn't know what to say. Because I'm going to tell you, I deserved what I got. And I knew I deserved what I got. I knew it. I, I mumbled out something. I had a different, I had a different perspective. Oh, we still, we still got into it. But I, and I was careful to back away from her reach. <laughs> but she realized that she had crossed the line. In, in, in her heart, she had realized she'd crossed the line. And she wanted to make it right. She didn't let it go on for hours. She wanted to deal with it right then. That's the way my mother was. If she had something, she, it's kind of the way I am too. When she had something she needed to do, she wanted to get it done right now. Didn't want it hanging over her head. And, and I, don't, I never asked her. We, we never talked about that for the rest of our lives. We never talked about that moment. Never spoke of that moment again. But I will tell you this. She earned something from me. She earned something from me that I never would have given her otherwise. She was willing to say, I'm sorry. We, uh, we were taught to learn to love our family. We never got away with anything. I never, ever, ever got away with anything. If somebody's going to get caught, I'm going to get caught. I went to, a couple of buddies and I went to... Um, when I was a teenager, I wasn't serving the Lord. In fact, when I was in elementary school, I really wasn't serving the Lord. I kind of was and wasn't, was and wasn't. And um, a couple of buddies of mine and I went to, uh, we were going to go buy some beer. And um, we knew, we had enough sense. It was a deacon's kid and me and, and uh, another guy. We were going to go out and buy some beer. And we had enough sense not to buy it around here because, you know, Braisewood people were everywhere. So we went across town. I mean, we went across town, all the way across town. And we were in that convenience store, and we were at the beer counter, and all of a sudden I heard, what are you boys doing here? Well, I looked around, and the other two guys were gone. <laughs> they were gone. And I'm standing there, and I turn around. The youth pastor of the church had just walked in that place. I, I tell people that was God's grace. I didn't appreciate it at the time, but that was God's grace. I'm going to tell you what, knowing that I was going to get caught kept me out of a lot of things. It didn't keep me out of everything, but it kept me out of a lot of stuff because I just knew I was going to get caught. One day, Mother and I and Dad and Susan and Lori, we were all in the room, and we were talking, and Mother was saying, oh, you were wonderful children. You were perfect children. This was maybe a couple years before she passed. You are perfect children. You never did anything wrong. I guess she forgot some of the stuff. You never did anything wrong. I was so blessed to be a mother of such wonderful children. And I said, well, mother, I, I just got to be honest with you. I just wasn't all that great. I said, let me just tell you some of the things I did. And I started recalling some of the things that I had done that she never knew about or I thought she didn't know about. And I began to tell her I did this and I did this and this and this. And then Susan started coming in. I think Susan and Lori didn't serve God for about an hour of their life and and they began to tell, God, tell mother what they had done. And, I, and finally, she put up her hands like this and said, I don't want to hear another word. I don't want to hear another word. Nobody say another word. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to know this. And she was serious. And she said, I want to believe that you children were perfect children. <laughs> and, and being the uh, kind of the instigator that I am, I said, well, mother, I really feel the need to unburden my soul before you today. <laughs> really tell you everything that I did. And she was serious. She said, I want to hear another word out of you. Not another word. I said, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We didn't get away with it, but, but she always let me know that she loved me. Never questioned that. Didn't always appreciate it, but I never questioned it. Lastly, my mother taught me to order my steps righteously, to honor God's word, to love the church, to love my family. But my mother taught me to trust God. She didn't teach it by her words only. She did. She spoke of her trust in God. She, she taught me by the life that she lived. In life, mother would tell me as I was growing up, God has a plan for your life, Steve. God has a plan for your life. I heard that one time. I heard it a thousand times. God has a plan for your life. And mother never told me what that plan was. Never. She never said, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, I expect this. She never said that about my future. She said, God has a plan for your life. What is it, mother? You pray, you ask God, he'll tell you. 
She told me in life, in difficult circumstances, you can make it. You can make it. You can do it. You can do it. I believe in you, Steve. You can do it. In uncertainty, and I'm willing to throw my hands up and say, I'm done. It's over. Done. Finished. No more. She would say, just keep moving forward. Take one step after another. Just one step after another, she would say. In life, she taught me to trust God. In sickness, she taught me to trust God. Mother was a fragile diabetic for over 40 years. And when I say diabetic, I mean insulin shots every day of her life. Pricking her finger every day to test her blood. Every day. As she got older, later years, it wasn't one injection. Sometimes it was five and six injections a day. And most of the years, she gave them to herself. I remember as a child watching because I thought, well, this will be interesting. Let me watch. I think I watched maybe once or twice, and I said, that's over. No more. I'm not going to watch anymore. And, and, and through it all, with regards to diabetes, mother never complained. Never. I asked her one time, I said, what about diabetes do you hate the worst? She said, injections. She said, I wake up in the morning, and I just, I just, I just know I've got to give myself a shot. And I, just, I just hate that. But she never talked about it. There were times where she was deathly ill. In Cleveland, she had gone into a coma in, in, in our house, in, in, in bed. She was sick, and she was in bed, and she slipped into a coma. So dad took her to the hospital there in Cleveland, and the doctor said, there's nothing we can do. She needs to go to the medical center immediately. Hospital in Houston immediately. We'll call for an ambulance. And, and after they had made arrangements and was taking mother into the ambulance, the doctor pulled dad off the side, and she, she won't survive the trip. She won't survive. She's not in good enough condition. This is serious. She will not survive. And, and just by coincidence, a Methodist pastor, a friend of my dad's there in Cleveland, was in the hospital visiting one of his members. And he went to my dad and he said, Earl, what's, what's the problem? What's wrong? And dad told him the story and the man said, the Methodist pastor said, can I pray with you? He took my dad's hands and he prayed. Very simple prayer. Very, very simple prayer didn't last more than about two sentences, and he said his amen, and dad said the moment that that man began to speak, he said there was just peace, peace. So he went home and got somebody to take care of us at the house. It was a school day, and he went to the hospital, fully knowing that the doctor said that when he arrived, she'd be gone. Come to find out, when she arrived at the hospital, she signed herself in. She had not only come out of the coma, she was coherent completely. She was in the hospital a day, and they released her, and she was fine. And I can tell you those kind of stories over and over and over and over again. Never complained. In sickness, she taught me to trust the Lord. There were times where, where she decided, remember when the faith movement was real big, and people would tell her, well, just stop taking your insulin. Just have faith in God. And she did. Became gravely ill sick. At times where I would ask her why, at times I would wonder why, Lord, if anybody deserves to be healed, my mother deserves to be healed, and he didn't. And there were times where we would ask, Mother, how do you feel about that? And she said, all I can say is I trust God. I trust God. She taught us to trust the Lord in sickness, in life, but she also taught us to trust the Lord in death. We had the opportunity to walk through Mother's dying days wasn't quick, it was slow. But rather than me tell you how she felt about that, why don't you listen to what she says about it? We want you to know we love you and appreciate you. Thank you many, many times in our conversation. Is included, you're included in our conversation many, many times. And we thank you for being so available to us too. And I pray that your prayers will continue to be with us as we endure our last days. I got word just the other day that, that I've got cancer, so heaven is closer. And I thank the Lord for that. These are the days we've been living for. That's what we've been living, to, to see Jesus. So we're encouraged. We're really encouraged. We're not discouraged. We're not downcast. We're encouraged. And I pray that your heart will be encouraged as ours are. She said, I want you to know that our hearts are not discouraged. She trusted the Lord. She trusted the Lord so much that she wanted to go home. She wanted to go home. She said to me, she said, uh, called me up one day and she said, Pastor Steve, um, 
I want you to pray. She didn't call me Pastor Steve. Steve, I want you to pray for me. She said, I'm, I, I'm just feeling so closed up. She said, I want you to pray. I, I want to go home. I want to go home. And I will tell you, as a son, that was a difficult prayer to pray. We'd already released her to the Lord. You see, she put her life in God's hands. This is what she lived for all of her life. She didn't live her life just to live. She didn't live her life just to survive. She didn't even live her life just to raise her children. She lived her life to see Jesus. And so when it came to the end, and she knew that the end was there, she knew that the end was close. She wanted to see Jesus. Steve, pray for me. I said, Mother, I pray for you every day, but I'll pray for you. And in that moment, I prayed, Lord, we have already released Mother into your hands. We trust you, Lord. I'm asking you, take my mother home. Those words came out of my mouth and she thanked me afterwards and hung up the phone. And, and for an instant I felt guilty. I just prayed for my mother to die. But then the sweet peace of Jesus came upon me. Son, I've been waiting all of her life to call her home. Mother's with Jesus today. I don't have any question about that. You see, I guess of all of the things I've learned at the feet of my mother, the greatest gift that she gave me is to know where she is today. I know you all can't say that. Not everyone can say that. But I can. I know my mother is with Jesus. The fact of the matter is, the last few hours of her life, she was in deep intercession, intercessory prayer. <laughs> So much so that she asked her daughters and daughter in love to leave the room because she was praying. She had business to do. She was ready to go home. Her work on earth was done. She knew it. Now let me tell you how much she trusted the Lord. She trusted God so much that she could leave us and know that we'd be okay.